Hi, I'm Dan Reed with the Community College of Philadelphia's Automotive Technology Program. Welcome to Car Corner. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the diagnostic tools that you use to check electrical circuits and a little bit about how those circuits work. First, we're going to start out with looking at what I have in front of me here, and these are called digital volt ohm meters or DVOMs. Some people just refer to it as a meter. But what this is, is this is an important piece of test equipment that's used to inspect electrical current, voltage, and resistance within an electrical circuit. And the reason why I got all these out is not because we're going to go through and explain how to use every single one, but the fact is, is that if you look at these on the surface, they look like they're very different pieces of equipment, but in reality, they're all measuring the same thing. Um, when I tried to explain to a student you know, different brands of meters. It's sort of like dashboards and different automobiles. You know, everybody's going to have the headlight switch in a slightly different position or the, the horn button and the cruise control buttons and that type of thing. But the fact is, is all those components are still there in every vehicle. And meters work the same way in the sense that they all measure the same thing, but there's obviously some differences between these that we'll talk briefly about. So first and foremost, this little guy on the end here, this is a, a very inexpensive, we'll call it a budget meter. Um, it might be good for some really, really basic tests, but the fact is, is it doesn't have the accuracy and the safety measures that we need to measure some higher current, higher voltages that we might have in, say, a hybrid automobile. And that's where a lot of these meters tend to come in. These are going to be an automotive grade meter um, and they're they're flexible in the sense that you don't have to use them specifically to check a car you could in fact inspect wiring or check voltages say in a house um, most of these meters are going to be good up to about safely 600 volts DC which is uh, a lot a lot of voltage compared to the average 12 volt battery that we typically have in an automobile but again, when you get to those higher hybrid voltages, you want to make sure that you have a meter that's able to safely uh, measure those, that voltage, as well as keep you safe, not damage anything, not damage the vehicle uh, yourself for the meter. Okay. So to look at all these again, there is a uh, liquid crystal display across the top. And that, that LCD display, if I just turn this red one on here in the middle, it's going to go through a self-test where for a split second it shows you all of the display turns on. That's sort of a prove out just to show you that the display is functioning properly on the meter and that you don't have any missing segments so that way when you're working you know a zero doesn't come across as a one because you'd want to make sure that uh, your display is working properly and there's there's no confusion as, as to what you're reading voltage wise. The other thing is across the bottom here you'll see that all of these meters have jacks this is where we're going to put in our test leads. And where you put the test leads dictates what the meter is able to read in terms of different amounts of voltage, different amounts of current. And I'll briefly explain what the difference between voltage and current is once I get a circuit board up here. We then have a rotary selector knob. <clears throat> the selector knob is going to allow us to change what the meter is able to read in terms of, again, volts, amps, ohms. Some meters have advanced uh, capabilities to measure such things as temperature or specific electronic components. And then finally, the, uh, the last thing that the meters all have is uh, they're all self-powered. Um, these are all, you know, they run typically on a 9-volt battery. You want to make sure that the battery is in the meter, that the battery is fully charged. Um, you want to be able to check your test equipment always check your test equipment before you actually start to test anything to make sure it's functioning properly. So that's just a very quick brief overview. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to look at um, how to test the meter leads. Uh, I'm going to take some of these off the table and when we come back we'll test some meter leads. So in terms of testing the meter leads, you want to first of all make sure that your meter is able to withstand the voltages that you're intending to measure. Um, <clears throat> these meters can read up to 600,000 volts depending on which category the leads are. 
you'll notice that right here on this meter lead it says 1000 volts category 3 or 600 volts category 4. Um, those categories dictate the maximum amount of safe voltages, AC or DC the type of voltage that we're measuring, and we wouldn't want to go above that. So in short, there are voltages that are much higher that people in the world have to measure, say if I worked in a power plant or high tension lines and that type of thing. These meters are not going to do that. You certainly couldn't measure something with, you know, you can't measure lightning with this. But we're going to make sure that the meter leads are rated for the meter themselves. A lot of these leads are interchangeable. So you can buy replacement leads or you can use leads from a budget meter with a quality meter. But you have to realize that if you do that, you're putting yourself at risk. These leads are insulated, so they won't arc. Um, the other thing is, is that the leads themselves are designed to work specifically with the meter. At no time would I want to try to make my own leads or jam something like paper clips into these jack ports and, you know, try to get a reading if my meter lead was damaged somehow. So, real quick, to look at the ports, you want to make sure that the ports themselves are not damaged in any type of way, that there's no cracks, there's no breaks, and that when I put these jacks into the ports, um, that, they, that they don't fall out, that the, that the jacks themselves, when I slide this in, they have a little bit of tension and make sure I get a good positive connection on there. I wouldn't want this thing to just kind of be real loose and just have to keep falling out like that. If that were the case, I wouldn't use the meter. There's a chance that that lead could pop out. Uh, it could possibly arc if I was measuring a very high voltage and damage the meter, myself, the, whatever it is I'm trying to measure. The other thing is, I'm going to move these meters out of the way here, is just to look at the actual wire itself. A lot of the meter leads will have multiple layers of insulation and these two brands in particular have a white inner layer that's uh, basically a nylon silicone jacket to protect the wire. If there's any kind of nicks or abrasions on the meter leads themselves, you, you can't use them. Um, you, I would never want to you know, wrap it with electrical tape or try to put some heat shrink tubing or cut it and solder it back together. Um, it's just not worth the risk if the leads themselves are damaged. So the first thing you want to do is always make sure that the leads are in good shape for whatever it is you're going to be testing and that your test equipment is not damaged in any type of way. The next thing, and this is kind of a test that any meter can do, and I'll, sh I'll demo it with these two specific meters, is that you want to make sure that these meter leads have a good connection back to the meter. And you have to first make sure that the meter itself is turned on. And so we're going to turn this guy on. And we're going to move this to this omega symbol right there. And that is ohms. That's a measurement to measure resistance inside of a wire. You'll notice that this meter has the same exact reading on there. And that both of these meters say OL or OFL which means that currently the leads aren't hooked up and there's no resistance in any, any part of the circuit. But if I take these jacks and I plug them in to this guy, if I touch these two meter leads together, this number should go to a zero, near zero, might be a decimal place in there. There we go, 0 0.03, I'm sorry, 0 0.3 ohms of resistance. That means that these meter leads are are, are good, they're connected to the meter, there's no breaks in the wires. Um, if I take this, I wiggle these guys around a little bit, make sure that those numbers aren't jumping around, shake my wires, give it a little wiggle check, make sure that the wires aren't broken. If I measure this one here, I should get the same type of reading. Again, a very, very low resistance reading, 0.015. I'm sorry, 0 0.156 ohms. Super low resistance. Anything below, I don't know, 0.5 ohms is, is a pretty good solid connection. Again, wiggle the wires. Make sure that my connection is solid. Push them in all the way. There we go. 
and I got a good solid connection right there. So I know that these meter leads for both of these units are in good shape. I don't see any damage. So let's move on to showing you how to take a basic voltage measurement using a meter. So the first basic measurement that you can do with this is we're gonna measure voltage. Voltage comes in two different styles, alternating current and direct current. They're kind of different animals in the way that they work. And without getting too much in the specifics of, of everything, let's just say for the sake of this TV show, we're gonna play in the direct current world, which is things like batteries and automotive electrical systems. Yes, there are lots of alternating current, AC current things in a car, but the fact is, is that we're gonna, we're gonna focus exclusively on direct current for kind of the sake of doing some basic explanation of how to use the meter. So right here on the tool, uh, it's in the off position right now, this first selection right here, we have Hertz, which is that HZ, and then you'll see there's a V with a, with a wave over the top of it, and then there's a V, with a dashed line and a solid line, and that's DC volts. So that's the difference between AC and DC. And it's, it's critical when you use the tool, I'll show you what happens when you don't use it right, uh, but the, you're gonna get an incorrect reading. And you don't wanna perceive that reading as having a problem, when in reality, the problem is that you have the tool set up wrong. So very quickly, if I turn the meter on to read volts DC, and I have two nine volt batteries right here on the table. If I take the meter leads and I place them on here, I'll notice that on the batteries there's a, there's a positive and then on the other side there's a negative. And that's part of what makes direct current direct is that it, the electrons flow from one side of the battery to the other. If I take the meter leads and I put them on top and I read DC volts, I put the red lead on the positive, the black lead on the negative, and you can see that this battery has, according to the meter, about 4.8 volts, and it's currently in the process of losing voltage. So it's much less than nine, uh, nine volts, all right? If I take the same meter and I read this yellow battery, I can see that my voltage is, in fact, nine volts, 9.07 volts DC. So that right there is really kind of a basic test. Um, if you had a car battery and you weren't sure if the car battery was, had how many volts does it have? Um, the fact is, is we say that if a car battery has 12.0 volts, it's effectively dead. It should be higher around 12.6, 12.8 volts. But simply taking the meter leads and putting them on top of the battery, you can use your volt meter, determine if the battery's any good. Now, one thing I will point out that can be a, uh, a little challenging is if I reverse the battery, I reverse the battery polarity, I can still safely take a meter reading. However, you'll notice that there is now a negative symbol on the front of the meter. That negative symbol is not really negative nine volts. It's just a nice way of telling me, hey, I have my meter leads reversed here. If I wanna get the correct reading, I can put it positive. What that allows us to do is it allows us to determine which one of which side of the battery is power positive side ground the negative side if you're doing some investigation and trying to figure out how a circuit is wired and you see a negative sign you know that you have the leads reversed and right there you can figure out the direction of current flow in that circuit if we have a larger voltage say from a power supply if i wanted to read that i can see Again, safely that my meter is, this power supply is putting out 14.2 volts. Um, generally speaking, any voltage below 48 volts, people can't really feel it. They can't feel anything in terms of pain or you know, being electrocuted uh, when it comes to DC voltages. When we get to higher voltages like that in a hybrid, that's where things get to be really, really dangerous. Um, and if you were checking a hybrid system, you would want to make sure that you were using a meter that was designed for that task that is, can handle much, much higher voltages, much, much higher current, and is electrically safely insulated so nothing gets damaged and nobody gets hurt. 
So in the world of before we had meters, we had this guy. I'm gonna turn this off, slide this over here. We had this, this was called a test light. Um, test light was a really simple, primitive electrical tool to test for voltages. Uh, but I'll show you the one tragic flaw of this tool, and that is that it tells me that I have power in terms of voltage and current, but it doesn't tell me how much. And this is a great example to show of how this tool can kind of lie to you. So we know that we tested these two batteries, and this guy had around 4 volts, and this guy has 9 volts. If I take my test light and I attach it to the leads of this battery, um, it lights up. Hey, that's great. That would tell me that I have some voltage there. If I take this one and I measure it, I don't get anything. Now what's interesting about that is the fact that this battery still contained voltage, but it wasn't enough to run the light. And that's the nice thing about using a meter. A meter is going to actually show you in real world numbers exactly how much voltage is there in terms of, of, of running a device. Maybe it's a tail light, starter motor, something, anything. The test light itself is, is a useful tool, but people use it incorrectly. They just hook it up and they start stabbing wires with this sharp piece. They start piercing insulation. That's going to lead to corrosion issues, wire damage down the road. You don't want to find yourself in a situation where you punched a bunch of holes in the wire and it's Swiss cheese and now the wire is degrading from the inside, adding resistance, damaging that circuit. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to get this set up and we're going to take a look at how to use this meter in an electrical circuit rather than just measuring a battery. So let's make a basic circuit. Now I'm not going to use all of this the first time around. I'm going to kind of make this really really simple circuit here. So I have a, I have a power supply. This power supply is going to supply my voltage as we checked earlier. I have a switch. The switch is going to have an open and closed position. Open means that the circuit is open. In other words, the flow of current is broken and there will be no current flowing in the circuit. The light bulb won't work. And then I'm going to use this little uh, yellow light right here and then we're going to circle back to the, uh, to, the, to the power supply. So when I set this up, I'm going to take the uh, power side I'm going to go in through one side of the switch. I'm then going to take this green wire and I'm going to come over to one side of the light bulb. And then I'm going to take this ground wire, the return path, it's going to go through the light bulb to right here. When I turn the switch on, and if my power supply is on, there we go, my light's going to light up. It's a very simple electrical circuit. If I close the, uh, if I open the switch and I break that flow of current, the light bulb goes out. Now, just a couple things here. If you had a situation where if this was a light in a car and you weren't sure, well, is the problem the light, the wire, the switch, like where do I go? You hope it's the light because that's the easiest thing to replace and what most people would replace just as a guess without even doing any testing because it's a common fail component. The fact is, is that when I have this circuit operational, I can disconnect any one of these wires at any specific point and the light bulb appears to go out. So the question is, is the way that this is wired, how is the current flowing through it? Well, if current's flowing through this, it's going through the switch first, then it's going through the light bulb, we'll call that the load, and then it comes back here to ground. Having the switch before the light bulb is called a power side switch. Now, power side switch means that the switch is located before the load. And there's a couple things that are a little different about that in terms of testing. But what I want to show you is this. If I take the same circuit and I turn off my power supply and I reverse these two items, I switch the light bulb over to here and I put the switch over here and I change how this works. Oops. Put my light bulb here. When I run the circuit now, with the two components reversed, 
what's happening now is the current is first flowing through the load, then it's coming through the switch, and then it is returning back to ground. Now, control-wise, that doesn't change anything of how the switch operates, and the same things happen if I disconnect the wires anywhere, the current flow stops and the light goes out. However, this is the way that most circuits in a vehicle are wired, and there's a reason. Ground side switches are typically utilized because there's less current flow, there's less shock, there's not a big arc, a big spark that happens inside the switch. If I'm working on a system and I want to design a vehicle to be reliable, I want the electronics to be reliable, what engineers found out a long time ago is that ground side switching is a lot easier um, on some of the control devices, a switch, um, in terms of longevity. So this is typically how a lot of things are wired. This can be confusing because a lot of people would, they kind of think, oh, I see the power goes to the light first, that means that it always, it's always on or it always has power. And the answer is yes and no, depending where we take our measurements, we're gonna see that using the meter can help you figure out where a circuit is defective. So what we're gonna look at first is we're gonna look at the meter with a functioning circuit and then we're gonna show you some circuit failures. So we'll start right into that. If I take my meter and I have my ground side switch, if I take my meter and I measure it, set it up to read on DC volts, get these around here. If I wanna see how much power there is in the circuit, let me rephrase that. I want to see how much voltage there is available voltage in the circuit. I can go directly to the source here on the power supply and I have about 14 volts running my little light. If I want to see if there's any voltage difference anywhere in the circuit, I have to go between a positive and a negative point in the circuit and I should get that same measurement. By doing that, what I'm verifying is that power is available to run the circuit. It doesn't mean the circuit's operational, and I'll show you what I mean. If I disconnect this wire, what I've done is I've stopped the flow of current going through this board, the light bulb goes out. However, if I still measure for available voltage, I still get 14 volts. Voltage is a measurement of the potential that we have in the electrical circuit. It's not a measurement of the circuit working. It's not a measurement of uh, if the light bulb is good or not. This tool won't tell you that. You have to kind of understand how a circuit is wired before you really use this tool. If you just get this thing and start jabbing and probing and get excited when you see numbers on the tool, that's not going to help you figure anything out. So what's interesting is I just want to show you that even if I have the wire connected, if I turn off the circuit flow, so I have a ground connection here and a power connection here, if I put my meter leads here again, I'm going to get my 14 volts. If I move the meter lead, I keep this on the power side, and I move this to the ground side of the circuit, you see suddenly I get no voltage. And the reason why there's no apparent voltage here is because this switch is open. So there's no electrical contact across these two wires. So this wire is kind of floating out in space. I might as well go like this and try to get a measurement out here in space. I'm still going to come up with pretty much zero volts, no matter where I measure it. However, once I turn the circuit on, this is now grounded back to here. If now when the circuit's on, I take my reading, I get my 14 volts again. So why is this important? Like why, why would I care that, that I get these 14 volts and no volts? Well, the fact is, is you have to understand as a technician where and how you're measuring the circuit is going to dictate what numbers you get on the meter. And even though the circuit may work properly, or not properly right now, there we go, I had a loose connection there. Um, depending where I take those, me those meter readings are going to possibly run you down an incorrect diagnostic path. If you, if you take 
meter readings and you, you come up with the conclusion that a wire is broken and you need to fix that wire, you're going to be spending a lot of time and money going down a path that can be very expensive uh, when it's not the problem at all. So understanding how to use the meter is key. So I'll just run through this again real quick. To measure my basic power, I'm going to measure at the source. Okay, I want to make sure I have my voltage available at the source. And then I'm actually going to measure my voltage available at the component. Measure my voltage available at the component. Here we go, and I have 14 volts. The reason why this is a valid test is because if the circuit is off, I should get no volts. However, if the circuit is on, let's say that that bulb is defective, I should have 14 volts. So again, understanding where you're testing, how you're testing is going to dictate what the reading is that you get on the meter. And let's take a look at a power side switch versus a ground side switch. So looking at a power side switch, where again we have the power here coming into my switch first, then going through my load, and then coming back to ground. When I measure this, if I turn the system on, I should get 12 volts here. So the current flow is coming in through here. It has to cross the switch first, then it comes through this wire, then it comes through the bulb, and then it comes back to ground. So if I want to verify that this circuit is functional, I'm going to take my meter leads, I'm going to place them. This is going to go on the power side, and this is going to go on the ground side, and I should get my 14 volts. Now, the thing that's a little bit different about a power side switch is that when the circuit's off, my flow is interrupted. And that's the same thing we had on the ground side switch. But what can be tricky is, is if I measure from one side of the bulb on the ground side, and I just come back here to the power side before the switch, the fact is, is I have 14 volts. All that's telling me is that this wire from the power supply to the switch and this wire from the, from the power supply ground to the light bulb is intact. It doesn't tell me anything about the bulb or the switch or anything like that. So if I wanted to come through here and I wanted to check to see if, this, if the switch was operational, say I didn't have my bulb in there, in order for this thing to have a complete current path through here, I'm going to have to have some type of resistive load in here. And the reason why is because the current's flowing through here across the switch, but since my bulb is taken out of the picture, it doesn't have a path home. That means if I measure between anywhere in the circuit and anywhere else, I'm going to get no voltage. Point is, compared to a ground side switch circuit that we looked at earlier, depending where and how you take those measurements is going to dictate again what type of measurements you get on the tool. So, point is, is that you can't blindly go into doing electrical diagnosis on a car without understanding where the switch is in terms of the load. Yes, I'm always going to have to have power directly across my load to make sure that the, uh, the component works, but if I get past that, this is where people really fall apart. They don't understand that these wires all have to be following a specific path, and if you get the switch types confused of where the power is coming into that unit, it's going to change the path that you have to go down in terms of your electrical diagnosis. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about that, let's talk about the difference between a series and a parallel circuit. Okay. So the two basic types of circuits that we have that we've talked about so far is power side, ground side switched. There's another variable to throw into the mix, and that's called a series or parallel, or there's a combination called a series parallel circuit. Now, a series circuit means that all of the current has to travel through one path, and a break anywhere on that one path is going to disconnect everything in that entire circuit. A simple series circuit would be one that we made previously, where I have a switch and I have a load and then I have a connection back to ground. This little simple circuit here is a series circuit because all of the current flow for the switch has to follow one path. A break anywhere at any one point in the switch is going to deactivate 
my load, the thing that makes light. So that's a simple series circuit. If I want to have a more complicated series circuit, what I could do is I could introduce another current path for the, for the, uh, for the power to travel through. So if I have two light bulbs and they're wired together in series, this is kind of interesting, you'll notice that this guy is lighting up. This one, it's extremely hard to see, but the fact is, is it's actually glowing. I don't know if it's coming across there on camera at all, but the glow is extremely dim. This guy is lit up, but as soon as I blow out this bulb, the current flow stops. And the reason why is because with this being wired in series, what's happening is, is this guy is, uh, these two bulbs are kind of fighting for all the current. What's interesting about this is if I take my meter and I measure the voltage that each one of these guys is using, there's a, a law in physics and electrical uh, diagnosis called Kirchhoff's law. And Kirchhoff's law says you have to use up all the voltage in a circuit. You can't have any leftover voltage when you finish completing your circuit. So if we look at our source voltage here, and I have 14 volts, if I want to start to measure the amount of voltage that each one of these bulbs is using, I can figure out why this bulb is not as bright as this one. And Kirchhoff's law says if you add up all of the loads, all of the voltage drops in the circuit, they have to equal up the source. So if I take my meter and I measure the current, I'm sorry, I measure the voltage of this first one, of this first bulb, I can see that the first bulb is using 13.9 volts. Now, if you put this in terms of math, come back here, if I have a total of $14.22 and I go to the bank and I deposit $13.93, that doesn't leave a whole lot of money left over out of that $14 to do more work. And that's what's happening here in this series circuit. The fact is, is this bulb is using almost all of those 14 volts, and this guy right here, when I measure the voltage drop, I have a measly 18 cents left over. Now I could actually write that out and figure that out on the sheet of paper for math, and it should come to about the total of the source voltage. But this is one of the ways where using a meter is helpful in determining is there something else in the way that's making my component not work? Why, is the, why are these two bulbs not working? Well, I can see that this first one on the series circuit is using more voltage than the second one. There's only so much voltage to go around. It is like money. If you use it, you can't get it back. You can't just magically make more money appear in your wallet. When you spend that money, it gets used up on a device, leaves less available for other devices. This is a problem with series circuits. We generally don't wire a lot of things lighting-wise or accessory-wise in a car in a series circuit because this is a problem. I wouldn't want that first device to steal all the available voltage over the other devices. That renders the other devices useless. So if we disconnect this and I wire this a different way, I wire it in such a way called a parallel circuit what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow each component to have an equal share of that available voltage. So we'll still leave the switch in here, but what I'm going to do is everything on this side of the board is going to be, I'm sorry, everything on this side of the board is going to be power and everything on this side of the board is going to be ground. What I have to do in order to use this switch is I kind of have to change a little bit of the dynamics of how this is wired up. So I'm going to wire all of these in parallel. You're going to see I'm going to plug that guy in there, that one there, take these other two wires, attach them here to here. So now all of my grounds are lined up. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of my powers, the power side of the switches, and I'm going to line them up as well. Okay. And then in order to get this to be uh, switchable, what I have to do is I have to connect them back here to the switch and I have to connect this back to my ground. So I'm going to take that, plug my ground into there. So this is now grounded and my power is going to have to come in from this side 
So the power is going to come in, go through the switch, power this, the power is going to run across this way, and then come back in through the ground. That's what makes this a parallel circuit. Both devices, all of the devices on this current track are going to get equal amounts of source voltage, and we can show how that is going to happen. All right. So if I turn this on, there we go. I got everything nice and bright. Now, if I measure the available voltage to each one of these components, my meter went to sleep there. If I measure the available voltage to each one of these components, I can see that my source voltage is 14 volts. And with wiggling them there, 12.6. 12.9 and 13.2, all right? So in the parallel circuit, we have an even voltage, roughly, give or take a volt or two, difference between the bulbs themselves. This is how most circuits are gonna be wired in an automobile. We wanna have equal power you might have to, you know, have one single switch that runs several tail lights or headlights and a parking light or something like that. Um, one of the things that can happen, though, with a parallel circuit is that if we lose a ground to one component, um, what may happen at that point is it takes out other components. The ground, the power sides, they're going to have to tie together. And this can actually be a useful diagnostic tool. If you have a wire diagram and you understand how the circuit works, you can go back and with our meter uh, measure our source voltage and then determine, gee, is the problem that these bulbs burned out or is that they lost connection? Most people would take a gamble and replace the bulb, but the fact is, is if I come back here and I measure the voltage at these bulbs, you'll see that these bulbs have no ability to complete a circuit. This one does, it gets 13 volts. This one's dropping all the voltage in the circuit. And these bulbs, of course, are not functional because I've disconnected the ground path to these. And when I hook it back up, they're gonna work. So having the ability to detect power or ground of a circuit is important in terms of diagnosing it, figuring out where the problem lies. If we had a different scenario where instead of having a defective ground side, if we had a defective power side of a circuit, that can also be easier to diagnose. If I come back to the power side and I take my meter, check my available source voltage. Again, we have 14 volts there. If I come in and I check this first bulb, I should have my 14 volts. If I come here to the second one, I'm gonna have nothing. If I come here to the third one, I've gotta have nothing. Now this is important because in order for this bulb to still have power, it has to have a complete circuit path somehow. And right now, its current is coming in through here, and this is its ground. These two bulbs, they don't have access to power and understanding how the circuit is laid out is gonna help me figure out, well, gee, if I have power here, I have ground here, that explains why that bulb works. If I have no power to these, but they have a ground path, that explains why they're both out. Thinking logically about a circuit of how current has to flow through a circuit is important because it helps you figure out where the problem is rather than just guessing at components or replacing them. If we turn this back on and all of the circuit works, that's great. But there's another scenario where we can use the voltmeter to determine where the problem lies within a circuit. And we're gonna look at that next. So this is called a fault board. It's a demonstration board that we use to show what happens with electricity when there's major problems. So, just a quick tour, we have power coming into the board. This gold colored component is a circuit breaker and there's a switch that comes in here. So this is my power is gonna come across. I have an electrical connector 
And then I have uh, two jumper wires that, that come across here to another connector to a, uh, to a bulb. Okay, and when the circuit is functional, I can turn the circuit on, I turn the circuit off, and the bulb works fine. And that's the way that you would hope an electrical circuit works. This circuit is a power side switched, which means that my current comes in here. My switch happens before the load, and then the current runs back down through the system and then out as a return path. So it's essentially, this is, it may not look it, but this is actually a series circuit. The current comes in through here, runs across the switch, up through, around this red wire, through the bulb, back through the bulb, black wire, back, return, path to ground. So it's a loop. And what we use this for is, again, demonstrating how to use a meter in terms of testing. Now, this is a better, better example of how something might be wired in a car if it didn't work. And typically, you have individual connectors in between components and between body harnesses. And when the circuit is active, if we have a break anywhere in the circuitry, if we have a, a, a dislodged connector or something like that, the bulb's not going to work. But the other possible scenario that you can have is that you can have a component where it's not receiving enough voltage to work properly. And that's where this can come in. If I disconnect one of these wires, my current flow is going to have to go through this unit right here. This is called a resistor. And if I complete the current path and I make the current go through the resistor, you can see that the bulb over here is now very dim. Now this is one of those scenarios where people don't understand why the bulb is dim. But maybe you do since you've been watching. So if I wanted to figure out why this bulb is dim, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first measure my source voltage I can measure that back here at the meter. That would be the battery of, you know, the battery power source in the vehicle. I would then want to measure and see where the power comes in to the circuit. So I'm going to measure with my meter again. And I'm going to measure, and I should have around those 14 volts again. They're back on the meter. As I continue through the circuit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to here to my light bulb. My light bulb connection comes in through this connector right here, and it's these two wires. And if I measure the voltage here, you're going to see that I get 2.7, 2.8 volts, something around there. So if you do the math and you do 14 minus 3, that means there's something in here that's taking up the rest of that voltage. There's something in here that's eating 11 volts of my, of my circuit. And that's why this bulb is so dim. There's only three volts left over to run this bulb. So what we can do is we can use the meter. And if I want to find where that component lies, this high resistance piece right here, the resistor, if I take my meter leads and I start to go through the entire circuit, I'm eventually going to come across something that hits around those 11 volts. So Backtracking, if we measure here on the ground side to the bulb, that's where I got my 3 volts, roughly. If I come back and I check here on the wire coming into the circuit, I still have those 3 volts. And what that means is that this wire is OK. There's nothing in this wire that's causing the problem. But if I come back to this test point back here, I'm going to see that that suddenly I have those 13 volts. So if 13 volts there, and what I got here is three. That means that I have something in here that's using roughly around 10, 11 volts. It's this guy, that's the problem. Now, generally speaking, this is not just gonna magically show up in an electrical circuit. There isn't going to be somebody who shows up in the middle of the night, magically puts a resistive block into the circuit for you. But what this resistor denotes is it could be a bad connection. When we have a wire connection in an electrical system, you want to have, there's a famous saying, you want to have the wires be shiny, tight, and bright. There should be no green, kind of gray, fuzzy corrosion on any of the copper connectors. You shouldn't be able to pull it apart with your hands. And in this case, this resistor is 
is basically acting as some corrosion in that circuit. If we get rid of that and we were to clean up that electrical connection and go past it, suddenly the bulb is going to get full power. It's important to use the meter to determine where that voltage drop is. And by using voltage drop to figure out where the problem lies in a circuit is really useful because when you understand how the circuit works and you fix the circuit, you understand why it's fixed. You're not just randomly throwing parts at it, hoping that you're, you know, throw enough parts at it and you're going to get it to work eventually. Okay. So other things that we have with the circuit board, let me turn this off here, is that I can measure current. Current's kind of a different animal than voltage, and I'll just, I'll, I'll briefly demo it. Current flow is how many, how many electrons are really flowing through the circuit. Voltage is the potential of a circuit. Current flow is how fast that voltage is moving through the circuit. And what's interesting, and what can be a little tricky with meters, is that when you go to measure current in the circuit, you have to measure it differently with the meter than the way you measure voltage. If you measure current the way you, we've been measuring voltage, you could actually run the risk of damaging the meter. There's a fuse in the meter to protect it, but you would probably blow that fuse. So let me get this reorganized here. I'm going to put this meter lead. I'm going to switch my meter lead over here to amps. And I'm going to put my meter lead over here to amps DC. And having to move the leads on the jack is common. That's, that's typically something that we have to do in the industry when we're going to start to measure current. The other thing is, is that the meter will actually become part of the circuit. All of the current that would normally flow through this board has to flow through the meter. The meter acts as a, as a counter. It's going to actually count the amount of flow of current in the circuit. So we'll disconnect this guy here. And I will rewire this. And we'll take a look here at our circuit. So real quick here, if I turn my circuit on, whoops. Where am I skipping out here? There we go. So my circuit's active. My meter is reading zero. Now, I can't just go in and measure current flow. If I do that, it's, it's going to be a problem. At this point, the meter itself is really just a single piece of wire. And if I'm going to measure the amount of current flow through the circuit board, I have to break the circuit. And I'm going to actually take my meter lead and then use the meter lead as a completion of the circuit. And I can see on the circuit there, I have about 2.2 amps of current flowing through the single light bulb. That's not a whole lot of amps, but it's enough to make the bulb work. However, if I take the same lead and I break the circuit anywhere, the current flow goes to zero. Current and voltage are two different animals. I can break the current flow anywhere in the circuit and the meter will read zero. However, I still have available voltage coming out of the power supply. If I take this and I run my resistive lead in here, we can see that the current flow is suddenly a lot less. Not only is that resistor taking up current, it's also limiting the, I'm sorry, not only is that resistor taking up voltage in the circuit, it's limiting the amount of current flow that's available to that bulb. It's kind of a one-two punch. The more resistance I have in the circuit, the lower the possible current flow in the circuit. Okay. Again, with measuring current, it's important to remember that when you leave the meter in this type of position, when you leave it, if, you, if I were to turn the meter off and put it away, um, an important thing about meter safety is you would never want to leave it in the current position. The reason why is because if I take the meter out of the toolbox and I go to measure voltage, which is the most common measurement that we typically use the meter for in the automotive industry, I'm immediately going to blow the fuse in the meter and possibly damage the components that I'm trying to check. The other thing is, is there's a limit to the amount of maximum current that I can safely 
put through the meter. This one is, uh, is rated right here for a total of 11 amps. And this, this little bulb was only drawing two. Um, if you add that up, you know, I get, you know, four or five bulbs of this size. I'm approaching the maximum amount of safe current that I can pass through the meter before damaging anything. So those are a couple key things that you want to remember about using the meter when you're measuring current. Current, measuring current can be tricky because again, if you have the meter set up incorrectly, uh, you take your measurement incorrectly, you're going to run the risk of damaging things. So that being said, um, if I move these components out of the way, I hope that you have a slightly better understanding of how to use a digital volatile meter and how you can use it to diagnose an electrical circuit, different types of circuits, series and parallel, ground and power side switched. Thanks for watching. I'm Dan Reed for Car Corner. Drive safely, take pride in your ride. Oh, man. Oh dear! <laughs>